Today we're talking about SIP, sub-irrigated containers and planters. We're looking at how to design and build one that is used as a raised bed. Behind me I have a prototype. This one here is actually raised off of the ground on 4x4 posts and it's worked really great. So based off of the way that I've designed this, I'm going to show you how you can adapt the most basic components to a raised bed construction, but it's going to be self-watering. And I'm going to show you the things that you really need to focus on, that you need to pay attention to so that you can find success. And also talk about some things that aren't as important. In fact, some sites and some tutorials are even going to give you bad information. So. I'm going to help you to see what things are going to ensure that you get the best working sub-irrigated raised bed. Why don't we first take a look at the raised bed that we're going to be building today. I'm going to show you how I built this box. It is 30 inches this way and 75 inches this way and the depth of this is 16 and a half inches. It has three rows of two by sixes. I have two overflow drain tubes that are located on the back side of this box. Everything below those tubes is going to be holding water in the water reservoir in this. This is the fill tube that allows me to put a hose here and just fill up the water chamber. All right. Are you ready to see how I built this? This is the very beginning of my prep work. You can see the spot that I've designated for my first in-ground sub-irrigated raised bed. My site is prepped. In my application, I had a layer of bricks that I decided to pull up and the base underneath those had already been nicely compacted and reasonably level. So all I had to do was throw some extra sand down and check my level. And I have like some nice bedding that my lining for the bottom of my box is going to be able to set on. My boards are all cut, but now it's time to look at this overflow drain hole. The overflow tubes will be on the back side of the box. What I did is I took into account the board that will be going next to that and then took into account where one of these corrugated pipes are going to go for your aeration screen and if you look in here that can kind of give you an idea as to where that overflow hole is going to be in relation to this from the very edge I came in four inches and from the bottom, I came up three and a quarter for my center and then drilled a half inch hole for the tube. For this overflow drain, something you need to take into account if this end of this tube is bent way up, the water level is going to obviously be way higher. Make sure that these little tubes are straight they don't need to be that long. So what I'm going to be doing is only having about half of an inch on the outside of the box sticking out, which helps you to minimize kicking it when you're walking by. And I might only have around an inch on the inside that'll be sticking straight out and it'll be going into the end of one of these corrugated drain pipes. For the installation, I thought it would be easiest to pre-assemble the first course of boards. I had them on a nice flat level surface. I was able to square up the corners and screw everything in and then just carry the whole box out and drop it into place. From that point, you can check your level uh, both directions. And now I'll be able to just build off of this, putting on the additional two uh, courses of boards. Here I am now, I've completed all rows of boards and I've even begun to put these supports on the sides so I'm measuring in the same distance on all corners and on the long edges I'm putting one in the center as well that is what prevents these boards from bowing 
and getting gaps in them as they dry out from the treating process. That helps to keep everything that you nicely squared square. So this, this holds everything together really nicely. What I did is measured from the corner the appropriate distance and then you get your speed square. Make that nice and snug and just have this just flush from the top and then you can clamp it into place once it's clamped into place nice and tight then you can proceed to screw everything in and move on to the next first thing you got to think about is what do you want the box itself made out of what kind of wood assuming you're going to do wood but probably most people are going to go one of two directions either using a treated wood or something like maybe a cedar or a cypress. Myself personally for this project I'm using treated. You definitely want to keep in mind certain things about treated if you choose to use it. First of all, treated lumber sold to consumers in the US and other countries as well has not had arsenic in it for more than a decade. So that formulation has been switched over to a copper-based formulation. Copper isn't nearly as much of a concern for a consumer as the arsenic had been. So you can feel a little bit better that way if you do want to use treated. Um, in general, working with treated wood, you may find that the dimensional stability isn't there. And so it can tend to warp, to cup, to twist. Uh, it's hard to get some nice straight boards look very carefully when you're picking them out at the store and even when you get them home they may not stay that way for long so keep a short period of time from when you've brought the wood home to when you actually are ready to build next at least four inches needs to be watertight so what type of lining can you use uh, it's better if you can get something that's intended for use as a pond lining Fish safe PVC pond lining is what I'm using for this. This is actually a scrap piece that I had left over from another SIP box. And so I kind of used some bricks standing on end like I'm doing here to help to hold the sides up and then went along with some staples and just stapled up at the very top of the edges way up above where the drain line is going to be and made sure to crease it and get it nice and tight all the way into the corners. And so I've done that and my last step, I have to integrate it into that overflow drain. So very carefully I marked out where that was and just cut a little slit and slid it right over that drain tube. Now of course you may be noticing how the lining doesn't go all the way up to the top. Well, what I'm gonna do is get a less expensive, like a six mil plastic, and I'm just going to run that like a nice straight clean edge all the way around the perimeter and that'll keep the treated lumber separated from the potting mix and that will help as far as those uh, you know crazy chemicals that we're all concerned about using treated but it'll also help with the wood being separated from the mix and uh, help it to be able to hold up a little bit longer and it won't rot as quickly what you need to absolutely remember is that this should all be one continuous uncut rectangle or square. Where the corners are, you're going to have extra pieces and you can fold these over. You could have them on the inside uh, so that you don't even see the folds like I've done here uh, on this side. This actually shows the fold on the outside so it's, it's visible for you to see how this is folded out and that's what is going to make your lining completely waterproof until you get to where that overflow drain hole is. Now let's talk more about this corrugated perforated drain pipe. The ends, if they're completely open, can very easily have some potting mix that can start to go in there and it just messes up the system a little bit and so you want to cap these off. Now here I have one that was in the 30 gallon tote system and I can show you how this is already capped off on the end and what I used is a synthetic landscaping fabric and put some strips of duct tape around there to tie it off really tight it's held up very well so both ends of these are capped and the way I'm doing it on this 
is I'm going to cut a tiny slit right here and put this down and that is going to line up with that overflow drain tube and then I'll be able to slide this right up to that and the overflow drain tube will actually go a little bit into this pipe and so it will be inside of one of these aeration chambers a nice open area that is isolated from your potting mix allowing only the water to just flow right into it it won't get all plugged up and stuff so I'm going to be reusing two of these from my 30 gallon totes I'll have the one on this side and I'll have the one on that side and then for the length of this going across I'll fill up the rest of the area my entire aeration screen is now in place I was able to utilize a couple scrap pieces or leftover pieces along with three brand new 10 foot pieces of corrugated perforated drain pipe if this looks a little bit different than other tutorials, photos, videos that you've seen online, maybe they show like two of these in a big box like this. Well, the problem is if you don't have a very high percentage of drainage, but instead you have most of the mix in constant contact with completely saturated water, then the system won't work to its full potential because stuff will get waterlogged too easily. And when you have a lot of rain, it's going to be a problem. Cloudy days, rainy day after day after day, stuff's going to get root rot and it's going to fail. But this has just a little bit of some space in between these. That little bit of space amounts to actually a lot of wicking potential. As long as you properly stuff a highly absorbent mix in between all these spaces, you should not have air in between the outsides of these pipes. You want something that's built from vermiculite, from peat moss, uh, something like that. In fact, you could probably just mix up pure peat moss and vermiculite only and stuff that in between these just on the bottoms just until you get up to the, maybe around the top and that would create a nice wicking bed to draw up the moisture yet the highest percentage of the surface area is actually in contact with the air that's trapped inside of these that is what's going to work the best in all situations not just when you're dealing with drought but when you're dealing with heavy rains so at this point, you're probably asking, well, wait a second, aren't you supposed to put some kind of fabric or something over those drain pipes? I mean, they have holes in them, right? What's going to stop them from filling up with dirt? I've been using these corrugated perforated drain pipes with nothing wrapped around them to keep the dirt out for years. And when I pull one out and I open it up, I find that it's basically completely empty. It doesn't get filled up with all kinds of silt in there from what I've seen firsthand after years of testing. So I definitely don't bother with that. And I don't think it's really that critical of a detail for someone to get wrapped up with. Um, there are more important things to be concerned about. It was filling the bottom portion of this box up with a potting mix and vermiculite mixture something specific to what I want to use on the bottom part only. Uh, it doesn't represent everything that will be above this point. It was a little bit of a tight fit for me. I only had around a quarter of an inch of space between those and I think that that should be your absolute minimum. If I had a couple extra inches that would have been probably optimal but I know that this is still going to work because I've put that stuff in there, I've squeezed it in tight, and there's definitely enough surface area to be drawing up moisture. And from what I've seen with SIPs, sometimes you can have too much moisture if they're not designed right, so I think that this is really the best way to go about it. As it turns out, I actually had some 10 mil vapor barrier 
for a concrete pour that was left over and I didn't have to buy any plastic to put along these edges and uh, this is going to hold up even longer and even better than that cheap 6 mil stuff. This SIP raised bed is not going to have any type of a plastic cover which would cause me to lose out on harnessing all the natural rain that would be falling on this. But still, there are times I'm going to want to water this and it is sub-irrigated so that means that you water from below and this downpipe right here is what is going to allow me to put water straight into the reservoir and bypass all the potting mix that's above this. I can just use the regular garden hose faucet, put it right up to that, and just let the water get funneled right in through here. And I have a hole that I drilled directly into one of these reservoir pipes and this is just going to get placed right into that. Uh, some tutorials will tell you to cut this at an angle, and if that makes you feel good, then by all means do so. So I chose to put this in the corner because it seems like it's going to be a better place for this to set. After I've put this into this hole, I'm going to actually put some tape around there to kind of seal this off uh, and keep it more stable and prevent mix from settling down in through this opening. Are you ready to talk about SIP potting mix? What I'm going to be using to fill the top part is a couple different bags of miracle Grow. Then I'm using some pine bark mulch. I also have some extra perlite. So two cubic foot bag, two cubic foot bag. I'm gonna use half of this three cubic foot bag of mulch, two gallons of perlite. This is going to add some extra aggregate for aeration. The coarse particles in the pine bark mulch also help with aeration and of course they take longer to break down so that you will find that the lifespan of the mix seems to be a little bit better than if you were just using pure peat. We really want to focus on aeration so using extra perlite is the way to go. And as I get this all together and I look at the consistency, it's possible I may even decide to add a little bit more perlite. But this is what I'm going to start with. I'm going to make a single batch, mix this all up on a tarp, and uh, put it into the box. And then I'll see how much more I need in order to continue filling it up. I used a half batch of what I just showed you to finish topping off this box. I'm sure I'm going to mix just a little bit more to finish topping this off the rest of the way. This is some old SIP potting mix that was in these 30 gallon totes. As I mixed up my new mix, I also integrated some of this old stuff into it because I don't really believe in throwing out old potting mix. I just keep figuring out ways to use it and I think that this is going to work out fine. There's a lot of new stuff and some of this more aged stuff that's nicely incorporated. And just to show you the consistency of what this looks like, uh, I think it's going to work out pretty nicely for this season. And we're going to see that as we kick into the spring and summer. But that's everything that you need to know for the actual potting mix that you're going to use in one of these. I mentioned about the pine bark and uh, I like to use that because it expands my mix at a much lower cost plus adding some pore spacing like I said and some will tout the benefits of pine bark as a soil amendment anyways but just don't rely on it very heavily use a reasonable amount without overdoing it otherwise you could break that capillary action which is necessary for wicking up the water from the bottom of your SIP. The last thing that you definitely want to give attention to is fertilizing. You have to fertilize this. Now if you're building it with mostly miracle Grow potting mix that already has a synthetic fertilizer built into it so you don't have to worry too much about that. You may want to add some dolomitic lime which is made of calcium and magnesium and putting some of that in there is going to help out but if you're using some non-fertilized components, if you're supplementing it with 
some pine bark if you're building this around mostly peat? Well, you have to put something in here for your plants to be nourished. You don't want to use manures, those gross composts that you get in the bag at the store. However, you could use some worm castings, which work great in containers and would definitely go well in your SIP raised bed. Getting some sort of a nice organic fertilizer is a great idea. You could even use some synthetic time releases if that's your deal. You can just spread your fertilizer around in the appropriate amount and then mix it into the mix and that would suffice. Many people use fertilizer strips. If you want to do a strip all the way down of fertilizer and then bury that under an inch of potting mix, you could do that too. That's totally up to you. It's gonna work even if you don't actually create fertilizer strips. All right, so what can you do to screw up your sub-irrigated raised bed? First and foremost, do not fill it up with topsoil unless you don't want it to work right. Think of this as a container, a really big container. And in containers or pots, we use potting mixes. So what you put in this needs to be something built around the idea of a potting mix. If you do that, you'll have success. It won't turn into a big muddy quagmire. You'll get good wicking that will occur as it draws up moisture from the reservoir but at the same time you'll have some nice pore spacing which will ensure that the roots of the plants will get air, they won't suffocate and die, you won't get root rot, and you'll have a nicely functional raised bed. Next thing, this design is 16 and a half inches deep. Now you could try designing something that is not as deep, something more shallow, but as you get more and more shallow, you're going to find that the potting mix stays more and more wet because the perched water table doesn't really stretch a large area and so it tends to be very, very saturated with water. And when you're doing a sub-irrigated container, that's really not the best way to go. So. I recommend 16 and a half inches. Using that basic uh, amount of depth is going to give me good success. Another way to mess this up is not paying attention to the placement of your overflow tube. It needs to be well below the tops of your corrugated perforated drain pipes. It should not be above them or to the very tops of them. Uh, if you use the dimensions that I showed earlier, then that's going to work pretty well. You're going to hold plenty of water, but you'll also capture some air and you'll allow a good distance for the soil to be able to drain out so that it holds water, but it's not overflowing with water. In regards to that overflow tube, make sure that you have it going inside of one of these reservoir chambers, inside one of these pipes don't have it just floating out in the soil in your mix. If that tube is just sticking in the mix and there's nothing to stop particles of soil from going into it, it's going to quickly plug up. And once that overflow tube plugs up, this thing is going to fill fast. It can very quickly get over full with water and you don't want that for your plant roots. Building a sub-irrigated, self-watering raised bed is a great way to get into gardening. It can do a lot to cut down on your summertime maintenance when watering becomes such an arduous task. It takes a little bit more work to set up up front, but you can do it in a way that's still pretty simple and it gives you big rewards. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and be sure to go to elbowpepper.com where I have all kinds of great information on SIPs, sub-irrigated self-watering containers, potting mix ideas, and all kinds of cool container designs that you may find useful for you.